Hi, Hi. Hi everyone and welcome to the first uh, uh, Connect webinar of 2022. I hope everyone had a, had a nice break in uh, a, a new year. Um, so just before we, we start, just a, a reminder that we have, um, we have our Connect conference uh, th this year. Uh, um, and, and this is from the 30th of March to the 1st of, uh, of April 2022. And uh, um, the, uh, the information can be found on our, our website and I'll just post that in the, oh, Faye's beating me to it, put the, in, the information in the chat. So if you are interested, uh, please, uh, please take a look. It'd be great to, to uh, welcome you to, uh, to Newcastle. And I put an emphasis on the welcome. I, uh, I hope that it will, um, while we, we will be um, uh, having facilities for online presentation, um, online attendance, uh, I'm really hopeful that uh, we can welcome a, uh, a large number of people to, uh, uh, to Newcastle. Um, okay, so uh, it's really a pleasure today uh, to, uh, to have Jerry Seidler uh, with us. And uh, so uh, uh, Jerry really is uh, an expert in X-ray spectroscopy and as the, the, the title of his talk today suggests, he's gonna uh, focus on laboratory-based X-ray spectroscopy. Uh, so Jerry is based at the uh, Department of Physics at the University of Washington, and uh, his research in, um, interests include the physics of environmentally and industrial relevant materials. Um, but a lot of this focus is on the uh, uh, um, is underpinned at the advancement of of X ray techniques. Um, so for today, if you if you have any questions, so Jerry said he's going to put in a little gap uh, halfway through the talk if people want to ask questions. Uh, but throughout, if you want to ask, then please don't hesitate to, uh, to put questions in the chat or to use the, uh, the raise hand function. Um, otherwise, I'll hand over to you, Jerry, and look forward to, uh, uh, to a, an exciting seminar. Thank you, Thomas. And I'll say that if a question seems uh, especially pertinent at a moment in the talk that comes in the chat, please do interrupt. I, I don't mind. Um, uh, all right. Well, thank you, everyone. I'm, uh, I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you to Thomas for the invitation. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, uh, my perspectives, at least on the status and trajectory of laboratory X-ray spectroscopies. Uh, I'm at the University of Washington. I've been fortunate to have a, a great team of students and collaborators in this effort and also uh, funding for a variety of stages in this development. Uh, the Clean Energy Institute in Los Alamos National Labs, uh, their involvement was critical in getting us past the prototype stage. Uh, more recent instruments you'll see are made with, uh, uh, for this uh, NSF um, uh, uh, Materials Research Center. Uh, we have longstanding collaboration using these uh, methods with Argonne Labs and the Joint, Senator for, Joint Center for Energy Sciences Research. Uh, collaborations also with NIST on some of this work, uh, recent support from NSF for doing in situ electrocatalysis in the lab, uh, molten salt work with Pacific Northwest National Labs, and um, STTR funding jointly with the Easy Zafs company, looking toward um, developing of laboratory spectrometers for education, for example, um, although Easy Zafs, of course, goes well beyond that. All right. So as an outline of my talk, um, I know that uh, uh, CONEX covers uh, much more than, than XAPS, and so it's possible that there's people in the audience who are not regular XAPS users. And so I'll give a very brief uh, overview of XAPS and X-ray emission spectroscopy and why to use them. And then I'll, I'll, I'll try to justify the use of the term Renaissance. And in particular, um, answer the question, why does the world now need laboratory XAPS and XES? And how is it different than in the pre-synchrotron era? Uh, I'll then go on and give a, a number of examples to demonstrate um, a, a small part of the capabilities of the, the uh, laboratory XAPs that exist these days. And I'll focus uh, on uh, uh, several studies on battery materials and then move, that'll be in the hard X-ray range, and then I'll move to the tender X-ray range and talk about some other applications focusing more on sulfur and phosphorus chemistry. And when I conclude, I'll wrap back around again to this question of what is the range of use models for modern laboratory XS? All right, so to begin, very brief background. Uh, of course, X-ray absorption would be absorption of a high energy photon. 
that would excite an electron, say, from a 1s shell to some unoccupied state above the Fermi level. Um, and X-ray fluorescence is the radiative decay that can follow after an X-ray absorption event. If one looks um, from on high at the X-ray absorption as a function of photon energy, yeah, this is, of course, the photoelectric effect. And so you see the sudden onset of increased absorption whenever you uh, pass the binding energy of an atomic shell. And if you look very closely at one of these absorption edges, as, as they're called, you see that there's fine structure. There's oscillations due to interference of the photoelectron wave function scattering off of neighboring atoms. <clears throat> of course, there's a, a, a considerable infrastructure for interpreting these spectra, but extremely briefly, um, and it's a battery material. Um, from the pre-edge features, you can often learn about symmetry and sometimes about magnetism of a material. From position of the edge, you could learn uh, about oxidation state, in this case, possible lithium content. That peak in some papers seems to correlate with damage in the battery material. And these oscillations that continue uh, quite far in energy, if you're lucky, can be used to infer uh, distances to nearest neighbors and sometimes beyond uh, coordination numbers and so on. So in general, XAPS is an element-specific probe of your local electronic and atomic structure that does not require long range order. So quite distinct from diffraction uh, and a sensitivity to oxidation state, local coordination, symmetry, coordination, and bond lengths and so on. All right, if we come back to the uh, X-ray fluorescence, when that's studied with very high energy resolution, it's referred to as X-ray emission spectroscopy. And so if we look at this, uh, a very simplified diagram of, uh, uh, let's say, molecular orbital formation um, between, uh, say, a metal ion and a, and a lighter ligand. Um, you'll see there's many different level transitions that are uh, that can occur, and the core-to-core -core transitions are typically sensitive to oxidation and spin state, and have a lot of similarity to XPS, but um, can have stronger multiplet effects and also tend to have smaller overall, uh, uh, say, shifts in position of lines with changes in oxidation state. But there's also, besides the, uh, the transitions that are purely intraatomic, there's also transitions from these uh, uh, molecular orbitals or more generally valence-derived states down to core levels. And so these are referred to as valence to core X-ray emission spectroscopy, VT VTC, or sometimes V numeral 2C. And they are mapping out the um, uh, occupied energy of density of states associated with bonding. And so you can learn about bonding and in some cases about ligand identity by looking at the V to C XES. So some spectra here, both for um, uh, uh, transition metals and for phosphorus. And you can see that there's a sensitivity in the K alpha emission of chromium to oxidation state. And for example, in this zinc valence decor study, um, the movement of this peak, often called the beta double prime peak, um, gives you a, a clear signature of the ligand in these different materials. Uh, down at the bottom, for lighter elements, uh, the shift in the K alpha is often much simpler. You can see here what's happening with phosphorus going from plus five to minus three. And the valence decor can really be quite rich with um, an awful lot of spectral information about chemical bonding. All right, moving on, um, you know, what is this, this so-called resonance from the Renaissance from the title of my talk? And why does the world need it? Um, so I'll give an extremely highly abridged lab XAPS technology history prior to 2010. So um, 1913 through to 1970s, uh, XAPS in the lab was very commonly done with an X-ray tube and a, a flat crystal monochromator. And uh, so Maurice de Broglie uh, was the first to absorb, uh, observe absorption edges in 1913. And then in the 1920s, Frick, Hertz, Lind, uh, often working either with instruments from Sigbon or with Sigbon, um, observed the X-ray absorption fine structure for the first time. Uh, there's, of course, a, a huge amount of work that's covered by this simple black arrow. But as an endpoint, I'll put the... Um, uh, very, very careful studies of Ferro Lytle, uh, then of Boeing Corporation, 
in the late 1960s into the early 1970s, which was such an important part of the collaboration, Sayer, Stern, and Lytle, that led to the modern theory of XFs and the, uh, uh, the famous physical review letter article from 1971. Um, at the same, at very similar times, though, there was work on using X-ray tubes with cylindrically curved analyzers um, uh, in various geometries. Of course, the famous names Johann, Johansson, Bahamas, and Toshwa. And um, that continued for many years and in the 1970s and 80s um, when uh, the uh, underlying theory for XFs was much better understood. There was much more effort to make laboratory instruments. Um, specifically uh, cylindrical analyzer Roland spectrometers, which were built by, by many labs and were commercialized um, at least by Gordon Knapp and by Rigaku and possibly by others that I've, I've left off here. I apologize if that's the case. Um, but the synchrotrons were coming already and the synchrotrons kept getting better and better. And the quality of the laboratory XFs often didn't measure up and there wasn't as much difficulty in those days getting synchrotron beam time. And by 2010, laboratory XFs was extremely rare, um, mostly legacy instruments uh, of the Rogaku type. So um, fast forward just a few years now to the XF 16 conference in Karlsruhe. And um, there were a few talks suddenly on laboratory XFs, um, one by my group, um, one from uh, Brigitte Kangeiser's group at Technical University Berlin in different energy ranges, and two posters, again, one from our group and one now from uh, Wolfgang Maltzer's group, um, at, uh, uh, again, at Technical University Berlin. And that was pretty much it. And at informal discussions with people over coffee, I'd meet someone, we'd talk, what are you working on? I'd say laboratory XFs, and they would, they'd be surprised. They'd say, I didn't know anyone was doing laboratory XFs anymore. So 2015, um, there was this uh, a belief broadly in the scientific community that XFs was strictly a synchrotron technique. So what we uh, showed in that uh, 2015 talk was that we could take the spherically bent crystal analyzers that had been developed over several decades for synchrotron emission spectroscopy and especially for RICs, and we could use those in the laboratory in a Roman circle geometry. So you would have your X-ray tube source, which is very polychromatic, and use the spherical analyzer in this geometry to make a monochromatic beam, and then scan symmetrically the position of source and detector to make a scanning spherical monochromator. Or for emission spectroscopy, now your, your uh, multicolored X-ray source is a sample illuminated by an X-ray tube, and otherwise the instrument works exactly the same. And this instrument was, um, was simple. Uh, we uh, had it commissioned in late 2013. This was Devin Mortensen's graduate, uh, a large part of his graduate dissertation. And so we had, we called the X-ray coffin radiation enclosure, uh, a pine box with uh, a lead stapled on it. And inside it was a very simple proof of principle instrument with the least pow powerful X-ray source we could buy, a spherical analyzer loaned to us by friends at Argonne Labs and a, a, a small silicon drift detector. And you would uh, uh, scan the uh, source and detector symmetrically inward or outward and have a translation stage under the analyzer to make sure that you stayed in the Roland geometry. And it worked, it just immediately worked. It was really painless. Um, we immediately got data that had essentially perfect agreement with uh, XAPs taken at 20 BM at APS. And we immediately saw that um, these laboratory instruments were surprisingly powerful for X-ray emission spectroscopy. So though there are some exceptions where you can do fluorescence mode in the lab, for the most part, you're doing transmission mode XFs in the lab because your flux has difficulty getting too much above 10 to the six per second. On the other hand, for emission spectroscopy, all of the photons from your X-ray tube that are above the binding energy can excite fluorescence. And that's actually quite a large core hole generation rate, a 10 to the 11 per second and above. And so you can, you can, you can be certainly um, uh, uh, at 1% of insertion device count rates for emission spectroscopy, which is great for anything that's more than a fraction of a monolayer, let's say. So um, that, was, that was really pleasant, a pleasant surprise and a very fast learning curve in 2013. And since then, we've gone through numerous generations of that technology. There's 
there's, um, there's no rubber bands uh, laying around in our spectrometers anymore. And um, based on uh, our sequence of work and also based on the um, very contemporaneous and independent work at Technical University Berlin by Brigitte and Wolfgang, um, uh, and then later work with other optics and geometries by Nemeth and Vanko and Slichetko, and then more work on the Roland Circle from Finland, um, uh, uh, independent work on transition and sensor arrays from NIST, and then also work of um, not instrument developers per se, but users of the laboratory instrument and the commercialization, all leads to this hypothesis that the world needs lab XFs and XES again, but for more reasons than in the pre-synchrotron era and for reasons that are often incompatible with synchrotron access. So that's the hypothesis of today's talk. <clears throat> when I speak of the status of the Renaissance, um, I'll say that there are several technologies for modern lab XFs and XES, and they work. Um, I'm mainly going to show you some demonstrations of chemical science applications today. And the discussion that um, I hope comes out of this um, is this question of trajectory. And for me, trajectory is not so much anymore about the technology, because there are several proven technologies. It's about discovering new categories of uses for lab XFs. And most often, these are going to be categories of use that are simply incompatible with synchrotrons. All right, so what led us to this hypothesis? And, and by us, I mean, broadly speaking, the, the community of people developing and using these spectrometers. Well, I, I admit that I've always found this figure useful. And so on the horizontal axis um, uh, uh, is the capability or quality of an instrument. Uh, ranging from introductory to world class, and it is roughly logarithmic. You can imagine a general purpose instrument being 10 times refined with respect to introductory and so on. And then on the vertical axis is how easy is it for you to get access to that instrument between you'll never get to use it or you can have it in your lab every day. So um, the solid black line is um, a schematic of what is the state for a, a wide variety of analytical modes that are commonly used in, uh, in chemistry and physics and material science and so on, including uh, fluorescence, X-ray diffraction, NMR, optical spectroscopies, and so on. Um, but in, in 2010, let's say, that's what the equivalent curve would look like for XFs and XES. Um, there were 24 synchrotrons, let's say, working in 2010, and I'd be very surprised to learn if there were even 24, if there were even five um, active laboratory XF instruments in the world at that time. All right, so now we're in 2022. There's about 200 synchrotron end stations, maybe 100 beam lines, depending on how you count it, <clears throat> that at least sometimes um, uh, support XFs. There's 40, maybe 50 now modern hard X-ray XFs or XES systems, a few dozen higher harmonic generation or laser plasma systems for soft X-ray studies. And that's all great. That's tremendous progress in, 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 in seven years, eight years, however you want to start your clock. But you compare it to X-ray diffraction and you think, boy, um, there's got to be some stuff, there's got to be some stuff missing. And so the question is, what's missing and what's the character of the work that's missing that still makes this curve for access versus capability look so strange? All right, so um, I'd argue there's three categories of things that can fill in the question mark in that diagram. There are the things that are proven, which is the laboratory instruments are great to prepare for the synchrotron. They've been proven for routine analytical chemistry for many materials, especially those with 3D transition metals or lanthanides, and for some metal organics. And they're great for academic research projects and for academic research programs. That is not just independent studies, but let's say entire dissertation efforts in some cases. And of course, they're great for education. Uh, in terms of what will likely help fill this gap, there's going to be industrial uh, research and development, um, whether it's in the mining industry, looking at battery components, catalysts, and so on. And um, likely, there will be a, a fair amount of work going on soon in routine, routine analytical chemistry related to the environment. 
There's still a lot of things we don't know though about um, where laboratory XFs and XES will go. And most of them involve society and industry. So it's really quite possible. Sorry, is there a question? Okay. It's really quite possible that the laboratory spectrometers could play a role in regulatory compliance, such as for chromium-6 content, but also quite possible for industrial quality control in these industries I've mentioned before, or more generally, in industries that create large quantities of nanophases because of the shortcomings of diffraction when you have very small nano. Okay, so that gives, um, uh, I hope, some motivation um, for XFs and XES, and in particular, um, uh, why laboratory XFs and XES are, are needed and how that's distinct from synchrotron uses. And now I want to get into examples. Before I do that, are there any questions? I'll just take a short break here. Okay. Not seeing questions then or uh, in the chat? No. All right. Then I'll, I'll continue to the examples. All right, so um, again, this was one of our first spectra from 2013. It was a lithium cobalt oxide battery laminate and um, in transmission mode. And the APS beam line 20 PM was at about 10 to the 10 photons per second. And our very first prototype with our 10 watt X-ray tube and one meter optic and bad helium bag was about 3000 per second. And um, we let it run overnight and the spectra was just fine. So uh, right away we knew concentrated samples don't need a synchrotron. Um, we also went on and studied many other kinds of battery laminates and, and there's a variety of information here we needn't go into. Again, the agreement with synchrotron is extremely good. But the key thing we learned here was that battery electrode laminates typically are ideal transmission XFs as samples. They have large, but not too large edge steps. You put them in the beam and, and things just work. And that certainly suggests that you can monitor synthesis or uh, uh, do, uh, uh, let's say, post-mortem post analysis after battery failure to see the status of electrodes. Um, we've done uh, 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 some in situ work on batteries, doing rapid cycling, uh, even with an earlier generation of instruments. And this is, I believe, the nickel K edge um, showing the, the shift in nickel with charge state. And indeed, at various different charge states, the edge position uh, behaves in different ways, depending on the amount of charge stored. And we're able then to do uh, the nickel zanes about every three minutes. And that's old optics and a slow detector. The uh, newer instruments using the same overall layout can do the same thing in 10 or 20 seconds. All right, so this, this right away then tells us that yes, you can do in situ, in operando studies of electrochemical systems. And if you want to, you can do them for weeks and really watch how does a system degrade upon cycling. And that's, that's a new application and it's something that uh, in some ways can be difficult to do with the synchrotron. Um, We've also studied supercapacitor materials, these uh, V205-based supercapacitor materials. And uh, uh, you all likely know supercapacitors provide very high power delivery and long life cycles that are interesting for a number of renewable energy applications. And um, this uh, particular uh, system, the V205 coated with a, a, a polymer, um, has very high specific capacitance, which is a, a very favorable figure of merit. Um, and the uh, coating with the conductive polymer helps deal with the low electrical conductivity of the pure V205 by introducing oxygen defects, right? Pure V205 is a semiconductor. But there's a question is where are the oxygen defects? How do they actually help? And how does that relate to eventual device performance? So in the lab, um, we uh, measured a number of materials with different um, uh, durations and thickness of the, uh, the polymer coating. And you can see that this uh, vanadium five plus pre-edge peak is changing with um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the effort with which one puts into introducing oxygen defects. And that makes perfect sense. And so from the Zanes, we would infer that the vanadium five plus uh, comes down about a third 
when you have the, the largest thickness of this polymer that's inducing the oxygen defects. Interestingly, the X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, whereas the Zanes is bulk sensitive, the XPS is only surface sensitive. Um, the, um, uh, the surface sensitive thing instead says the vanadium 5 plus becomes extremely small by the time you're at this 12 nanometers of, uh, of thickness. So clearly, um, uh, this is a strongly surface driven um, uh, oxygen defects, which probably is not surprising given that it's a surface coating method. But we were able to um, uh, get at this, uh, this idea that best performance involved some amount of um, bulk oxygen vacancy. Sorry, I don't think that's 1%. Um, uh, and uh, most of it being at the surface. I'd refer people to this paper for more details. So here, access to the lab-based instruments provided rapid feedback on these approaches. You know, our friends in material science would bring over another set of samples every two weeks until we had a complete study and an understanding of what was going on. And that kind of fast iteration is very difficult with the synchrotron. And that actually led to um, not just a few publications, but helped support an entire research program of two graduate students uh, to get to their, uh, their PhD on these vanadium-based uh, supercapacitor materials. Um, the last hard X-ray example I'll give you is something that's ongoing, but I think is, is really interesting. And so zinc chloride solutions are a very classic kind of ionic liquid, and they're important for mineral formation, industrial processes, and zinc ion batteries. And there's um, uh, a variety of, of possible chloride ion, uh, pardon me, zinc environments. So the zinc is in the center here. And so at low chloride ion activity, low concentration, you expect octahedral coordination from six waters. On the other hand, at extremely high chloride ion activity, you would expect tetrahedral zinc tetrachloride two minus. And the question is, how strong are the bulk consequences of ion pairing? How do influ in interfaces influence ion pairing? And are these um, intermediate coordinations realized? So there's a significant literature on these intermediate coordinations, and in particular on, on the zinc chloride system. And you can see here, there's three different theoretical approaches, and they actually have um, a rather dramatic disagreement about what the, uh, the equilibrium diagram um, uh, uh, and the equilibrium constants for these different intermediate moieties should look like. So we decided we would do valence decor XES. There'd been a fair amount of XFs on these systems already. And um, they're very tricky to interpret the XFs because of the large role of the second coordination shell. Whereas here, we only really want information on the first coordination shell. So we said, OK, valence decor XES should be strongly sensitive to coordination geometry and nearly insensitive to the second shell. So uh, my grad student, Dewash Dekal, modified one of our lab instruments and made a simplest holder for a quartz capillary. And you can see our entrance slid into our spectrometer there and the X-ray tube, here's some CAD. And the valence decor data is really quite lovely. So this is um, a simple zinc chloride solution as a function of concentration, whereas here you stay at one molal zinc chloride and add an additional sodium chloride or lithium chloride. And when you have this, uh, uh, this very large first feature and smaller second feature, um, we know from reference systems that that's tetrahedral. And on the other hand, when you have the one broad peak here shown as the blue dots, um, that's purely octahedral with water coordination. So with the aid of TDDFT, which was really important to understand what would the intermediate states look like if they're present, um, we've calibrated the valence to core XES to get the zinc chloride coordination number. And um, this is going to be, uh, sorry, there's a paper that will be submitted very soon with um, uh, uh, Darren Driscoll, John Fulton, Neri Govin, Molly Bala Subramarian, and uh, Tim Fister. You may have gotten everyone there. Uh, be submitted very soon uh, on this work, but, but this is going to be a full research program for the student because we're now making a liquid cell for the lab spectrometer that's temperature controlled. And we're going to be able to study this ionic liquid from just above zero centigrade up to 150 
and we're really going to be able to address this question of the equilibrium constants of the different intermediate moieties of the zinc chloride system. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, what Duwash discovers in the next few years. All right, I'll move on now to tender x-ray results. And that involves um, slightly different technology. So um, in 2015, um, we really wanted to go to lower energy x-rays, um, but we didn't want to make a giant vacuum chamber for a half meter, or I don't even think the half meter optics existed then, maybe, but I didn't have one. We didn't want to have to make a giant vacuum system and use the same technology that we had used for the hard x-rays. And so um, we realized, uh, sort of rediscovered something that had at least been partially known in the community previously, that a small spot size isn't necessarily needed for fine energy resolution. And also in an independent project in plasma physics, we had already been developing our own x-ray cameras um, for low energies with about three micron pixels. And so Will Holden, now with Easy Zaps, um, put that together into this adorable little instrument. And you can see the size of the breadboard is, is, is really quite small. And what's going on inside here is there's a small cylindrically curved analyzer and the X-ray tube that's again right here is shining and making a large spot on a sample that's well inside the Roland circle. And when you do the ray tracing, you find that you have um, a good averaging over the surface of the sample into different collection cones, uh, striking the crystal on the Roland circle, and then refocusing here on our X-ray camera, this red, uh, this red instrument here. And so it's a dispersive instrument that doesn't require a small spot size, but still does average over sample and homogeneities. So it's quite, quite a nice thing Will came up with. And it works wonderfully. Um, this was one of our one of our earlier application papers. Um, this is the phosphorus K alpha. Pardon me, the sulf, the phosphorus K alpha for indium phosphide quantum dots with zinc sulfide cladding. And um, you can see that um, uh, we infer by comparison to reference standards that it's about thirty eight percent oxidized and uh, sixty two percent reduced. And that agreed well with the NMR, um, except the, it took the, the XES took 50 times less time and 50 times less sample to come to a very similar conclusion. And so that told us there could be a wide range of problems. Right now, they're using 31 phosphorus NMR that could instead be addressed by phosphorus K alpha XES. This was a quantum dot LED project. Um, the capstone of Will Holden's dissertation was this a very comprehensive study of theory and experiment for sulfur chemical and electronic structure, sulfur organics. And um, uh, it's, a, it's a very nice paper. And it also took us in another new direction, which was um, uh, realizing that um, uh, it wasn't going to be that hard to theoretically make a, a very large training data set um, uh, that would be reliable for sulfur valence to core XES and Zanes. Uh, we've written this paper out in PCCP on unsupervised machine learning for chemical classification of XAS. And those of you interested in such things, I refer you to it. But it came out of the lab XS. Um, last couple things. Um, we've just finished commissioning this instrument, which is a small double spectrometer that simultaneously measures phosphorus K alpha and K beta. And this is our first instrument that lives inside a glove box to measure air sensitive samples. And you can see here it's installed. The double spectrometer, the little pieces are right here. The x ray tube is coming in from the back. You can see the black case of the x ray tube and the samples on this wheel. The sample wheel would get pushed forward when it's time to actually take data. Um, the um, helium box, which could be a vacuum chamber, but we run into helium is also thick enough to serve as the radiation enclosure. And the data is wonderful. Um, uh, here is um, uh, phosphorus K alpha for reference compound gallium phosphide, which is reduced, and the, uh, the phosphate, which of course is oxidized. And the sequence of samples, which are all nickel-2 phosphide, but with different, uh, the 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 
is referring to in inverse order, this isn't quite written up yet, um, how much air exposure the sample has had. And so the nickel two phosphide is down here. And with air exposure, you see that you gradually become a phosphate. And this is the uh, valence to core emission. And um, uh, it's interesting that it doesn't quite have as rapid a change to a signature of phosphate as the K alpha does. And so it makes us wonder, could there be some intermediate oxidation state of the phosphorus that's not a phosphate, but um, some simpler uh, kind of phosphorus to oxygen coordination. So that's something we'll play with as um, uh, Jared Abramson is, uh, is writing up this instrument paper. And uh, hopefully that'll be submitted within a month or two. Last instrument is uh, with NSF funding, where uh, this is largely built but slowed down by COVID, as so many things are, which is an in lab system for doing operando um, oxygen evolution reaction of the metal phosphide electrocatalytic water splitting. So I've got um, three slides of conclusions to try and I hope stimulate some discussion. Um, I'll remind everyone of. Um, uh, of this graphical representation of what's proven, what's likely, and what's possible. And elaborate that what's proven is an awful lot of work on batteries, catalyst, actinides. Um, there's been a, a really good amount of study of actinides specifically because both for air sensitivity and safety regulations, it's hard to get them to the synchrotron. Um, ionic liquids, cultural heritage materials, quantum dots, other nanophases, things that are air sensitive. Um, likely would be XFs for air sensitive, that is XFs is going to be in a glove box sooner or later. Um, very long baseline studies of batteries, trace level XCS for environment, and a lot more in situ catalysis. And for possible, well, that's something I'm trying to learn about. And so if there are industrial users here who'd be happy to chat, I'd love to pick your brain about how can lab XFs play a role, let's say, in industrial quality control or R&D at different places in the life cycle of a manufacturing process. Um, I'll come back the last time to this hypothesis, which is that if the hypothesis is true, then um, there's a bunch of other things that are specific to the community of laboratory XFs distinct from synchrotron XFs that ought to be occurring. And so with Rene Bess and Christopher Schlesinger, um, uh, IAEA had us come and write a report on current developments uh, for lab-based XFs or XAS. And the motivation there was to lay the groundwork for figuring out how IAEA might be able to assist with um, uh, getting uh, better XFs access for people in developing countries, scientists in developing countries. Um, uh, another thing that needs to happen is software that's specific to the laboratory instruments. There's this wonderful package from um, uh, 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 Corkill and Hyatt's group at Sheffield on Hermes, which is this very nice GUI-based software for pre-processing of XAS for lab roll and circle instruments, like I've been showing you all this data from today. Um, it's also, I think, notable, there's this, this uh, recent review article on modern, modern X-ray spectroscopy. And it's a very good review, but something important to note is none of the authors are, instrument, are the instrument developers. These are users and they're giving their perspective. And that's an important step, I think, in the development of the, uh, of the laboratory spectroscopy. And finally, there needs to be networking um, uh, among uh, the people using uh, laboratory spectroscopy. And Simo Hutari's taken the lead in that. And unfortunately, a workshop he's tried to organize has been delayed uh, by COVID, but hopefully will be coming along soon. And we'll see how that, uh, how uh, from all of these, we'll see how the, the, the community of laboratory XFS users, how it does overlap and doesn't overlap with the community of synchrotron XFS users. And again, driven by this idea that the um, laboratory XFS is needed often for reasons that are, excuse me, often for reasons that are incompatible with synchrotron access. With that, I thank you and I look forward to your questions. Okay, thank you very much, Jerry, for a really, uh, really great talk. Um, so, uh, um, as I said, if you if you have a question, you can either write it directly in the chat or you can use the hand up function. Um, um, just actually just um, while people may be typing and things like that, I'll, I'll ask the first question. Um, so 
with 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 lab based X ray spectroscopy, I, I always imagine that it's um, we're kind of building towards a, a setup that's, I suppose, similar to most chemistry departments at an X ray diffraction. I, every chemistry department has the ability to do X ray diffraction and, you know, adding X ray spectroscopy on this. It, 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 is that how you see it, or do you potentially see different areas that may well kind of come out that may be different to X ray diffraction? I think it's, I think it's a great question, and I think it comes back to, um, the what will eventually be the population of uses between research projects and research programs. So if the dominant use is someone who's a material scientist infrequently needs to study their vanadium oxidation state, um, something that's very materials characterization where most likely the student involved is not going to become an expert in the technique then that likely needs to be uh, uh, done with an instrument in a shared user facility that has some support to buy someone who, who can help them understand the data. Um, on the other hand, if the instrument's intent to use is a research program where it's going to be used for a large number of years to do many different types of in situ catalysis studies, um, then that's much more research group specific. Um, and in industry, I think uh, the exact same split is going to occur and in regulatory compliance, sorry, regulatory be different which is that it'll either be shared, shared facility or specific group. Regulatory, I think, will be really interesting because there, then possibly quality control, the need will be for one thing that's very specific, not a general purpose instrument, but you know, in, in the spirit of X-ray fluorescent systems that do nothing but quantify the amount of sulfur and oil or sulfur and gasoline, right? It's an instrument that gives you one number. And um, uh, uh, let's say for chromium-6 speciation for ROHS regulations in, uh, uh, in the EU, you may well need an instrument that gives you one number but does not require expertise to use. And so I think there's kind of a continuum and the continuum depends um, partly on how general purpose is the need for the particular instrument. And partly this distinction again between research projects versus research programs. As you say, I think the general need is is um, okay for, as a computational chemistry. I'd, I'd describe it as a self consistent problem. At the moment, I think there's a lot of people that would use X ray spectroscopy, but because it's largely based at the synchrotron, don't know they need it. We don't know enough about the technique. You know? And as it starts to proliferate more, we'll realize they need it, and then that will kind of feed the cycle. Um, but um, yeah, okay. That's, uh, um, are there any um, are there any other questions? Um. um Tom, I have a question if I might. Yeah, go for it. I I love the sample with the zinc chloride, um, Jerry. Uh my background is is in solution chemistry, and I did all my thesis in studies of uh, complexes in solution and things like that, ah. Texas. And for me, this is just beautiful. I, I wanted to ask you, how quantitative is that? So, you know, when you see the tetrahedral tetrahedral and different species, how, how much if <clears throat> so it's a really interesting question, and it took us it took us an awful lot of arguing amongst ourselves and repeated entreaties to our theorists to sort out. So what's neat here, and it was really unexpected to us, and it might be specific to the zinc chloride system, was something unfortunate, which is that those intermediate the spectra for the intermediate states, where maybe you have one chlorine in three waters or two chlorines in two waters turned out to be linear superpositions of the octahedral and tetrahedral end spectra. And it was an accident because the octahedral peak happens to be at almost the same energy as the low energy shoulder of the tetrahedral. Ah. That was a pain. <laughs> All right, so, um, uh, but we had the theory and we were able to use the theory to figure out, okay, roughly what is the linear superposition? And it turned out to be really close to mole weighting. That is that if you had one chlorine, it was pretty close to 25% tetrahedral plus 75% octahedral. And so, I mean, we even have, um, you can tell how good the linear superposition must be because we have isospecific points. Isospecific point, yeah. So although we can't say what is the distribution 
of tetrahedral with four chlorine as opposed to tetrahedral with three chlorine, we do think we're getting a reliable estimate of how, on average, how many chloride nearest neighbors are there. Wow. We're hoping that in other ion pairing systems, you won't have this, this very specific bad luck, um, but um, uh, we, think, we, think it's, we think it's pretty good and the results turn out to be pretty interesting um, in this debate about the um, uh, uh, equilibrium constants for the different uh, uh, chloride ligands. I am really looking forward to read the paper. It's, it's, it's just beautiful. <laughs> it's just amazing. Yeah, it's not always fast. The, um, the very concentrated zinc chloride, we also did the bromides. The bromides are, are really not fast. Um, uh, might take us two days for a spectrum or even two and a half or three days for a spectrum because there's so much absorption from the, uh, from the bromine. But um, we can be patient. Yes, yes, yeah. no, it's, it's, it's beautiful. You should try the, the chromium as well. This is uh, quite interesting as well. The way that- uh, Chromium chloride? Yeah, the way that- ah, the, okay. The, the waters and the chloride is, is very nice. Um, and I have another question if, if I may, completely different, but it's a curiosity. What crystal did you use for the sulfur, K-alpha? The sulfur? Mm -hmm. um, pretty sure silicon 111. Silicon 11, okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and do you have mm. a problem with the fact that it's quite far away from backscattering then? Sulfur? Uh, um, so, wasn't, so, that, wasn't that bad? I would have thought, around, I'd have to look it up. I would have thought around 70 degrees. Okay. Okay. 70 degree Bragg angle. I don't think it's okay. too much off from that. Um, but yeah, I'd have to go back and look. But it's Johan, isn't it? You're still using Johan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um uh we actually we've recently been um uh, we've gotten some small Johansson, the cylindrical analyzers from Alpix in France. Uh -huh. And we tested some earlier iterations, and the company was wonderful to keep iterating to make them better. And we just haven't had a chance because of coming back from COVID to stick them in a spectrometer and, and test their performance. But, um, uh, but, but I've been very impressed with the dedication of Alpex in trying to make that optic for us. Okay. Yeah, we end up to get rid of Johan error for sulfur K-alpha. Yeah. Um, I think we put a mask where maybe it's only two millimeters wide okay. on the analyzer. So, so very, very small, but the signal's very strong for concentrated samples and it hasn't been a problem. Okay, so you still you still can use the, the Johan, but very small analyzer. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, phosphorus, you're closer to backscatter. And uh, I don't remember if one of our analyzers there might have been the germanium. I, I don't recall right now. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so see if there's any final hands or anything. Um, um, it doesn't look that way. So uh, um, again, thank you very much, Joe. For anyone, uh, a, a reminder that the, the um, well, I suppose two reminders. The first reminder is uh, that this video will be uploaded onto our YouTube channel. Um, and the second reminder is that the Global XAS uh, Club, which which Jerry actually runs, has an even has a, a YouTube library much much greater than we do. Um, uh, and uh, uh, and right, uh, the advert is on the screen now. And so um, for all your X-ray uh, spectroscopy desires, uh, you can uh, look at the two uh, YouTube channels. And uh, that's one of the the silver linings of, of COVID and lockdowns, the amount of, of resources that are now available online. Um, so yeah, thank you very much again, Jerry. A really great talk. My pleasure. Thank, really yeah, thank you for the invitation. And um, yeah, have a, um, I hope everyone has a great rest of the day and um, yeah, enjoy the new year. Okay, take care. Thank you so much. <laughs>